All right, everyone, welcome to our last major webinar for the 24B Army STTR solicitation period. My name is Matthew Bigman with VTARC. I'm going to be your host today. <coughs> Joining us is Mr. Tyler Temple, uh, Patricia Fox, and Stephanie Burgos. They are representatives of the Army STTR program and Army contracting. The goal for today is to basically give you a chance to have one last opportunity to get your answers to your pressing contracting and application questions live. So this is an opportunity for you to do a Q&A with some of our contracting and BAA experts, just to get an idea of what can I do to make sure I'm not making any common mistakes, that I'm answering everything, that I understand the BAA correctly. What this webinar will not be focusing on is any of the technical questions. So if you have technical questions at this point in the process, you can check out if your peers asked any of those questions in the CITIS system on the BAA. Any responses to questions on that are publicly listed, so you'll be able to look at that. And also be sure to go to armystr.com check out our events tab and look at our topic webinars and industry day webinar. There you'll be able to find resources and recordings of some of the previous Q and A's with the topic authors and get additional information. But this is strictly administrative today. So welcome everyone to the webinar. Go ahead and please let us know in the chat what time zone you represent and what company you are or what research institution you are. Today, as I said before, I'm giving a very brief introduction and then we're going straight to the contracting Q&A. If you have any questions for our experts, we had a few pre-submitted. I'll be adding those as the meeting progresses, but go ahead, click on that little Q&A tab right now, get your question in the queue. The sooner you submit, the more likely it is that we're going to have time to answer your question today. You can feel free to use the chat, the people tabs in the upper right hand corner of the screen to reach out and network with each other in the background, ask additional questions. But if you've got questions, please put them up on the Q&A tab on the right side of the screen. You're going to see a small resources tab on the right. You're going to be able to find our BAA Q&A webinar. Uh, PDF. So that was our last Q&A from last week. That's got some additional details. I'm giving a very abridged version of that, but it's got some advice for your BAA application on how to make sure you're doing it right. We've also got Army STTR 101 if you're interested, and we'll put other useful links as the meeting progresses into that chat. <coughs> I do want to point out that everything we're speaking about today is not meant to replace the official guidance in the DOD 24B BAA. This is just an outline of potential actions that you can take for success and should not be indicated as a guarantee of success. For those of you who have joined us before, you have heard this before. For those of you who are new, check out armystr.com. You can find links to additional resources, information, information about previous winners and then recordings of all our previous events if you're looking for more information or references. We are not sponsoring active networking after this event. For those of you who have joined us before, we usually have some networking tables set up. We will be keeping those tables open for a bit after the webinar, but we're not going to be going around really smoozing, helping you all network with each other, do that stuff. We're about six days out, so if you're still looking for a research partner or a small business partner, you're welcome to check out the tables. You're welcome to connect with peers in the field to get more information, but we will not be actively manning the networking tables today. Um, that being said, if you're a research institution and you're still looking for a small business partner on one of these topics, we're happy to set up a table for you. Just go ahead and use the messages option in the upper right hand corner of the screen and send myself a message directly and I'll get that table arranged for you, you to have set up when we hit the break. Last but certainly not least, I just want to remind everyone of our current timeline. Noon is when the BAA closes. That is noon Eastern. That is a strict deadline. That means that if you're trying to upload your file 1159 and it finishes uploading at 1201, it means it's invalid. That means if your internet's gone out, if the website's gone out, 
it's not counted. That is a strict deadline. So please, 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 I'm begging you here, give yourself some grace. Don't upload at 11.55. Upload sooner. If possible, you have until noon, but that also means you only have until noon. Please give yourself some buffer when you're uploading. It's a very strict deadline. Last but certainly not least, if you have additional questions or you don't feel comfortable asking some of your questions publicly, you can use the address up here on the webpage. And you can find this in our Army STTR 101 PDF and our BAA Q&A webinar PDF. But uh, <coughs> feel free to <coughs> use this contact information up on the webpage if you have any additional questions about the Army program, about the BAA. Okay, before I hand it over to Ms. Patty Fox to talk about Army contracting, give you some general advice before we start the Q&A in earnest, I do have some general advice for myself. This is in a very abridged version of the BAA Q&A from last week, but just as a reminder, read and follow the guidelines to Army STTR. There is an Army STTR section in the BAA those are the guidelines you want to be focused on. That's what you want to be following. Make sure that when you're putting in your proposal, you're including all materials requested and following the page limits. That's a very difficult thing to do, but it's important that you are keeping within those page limits. Anything past the page limits will not be read and that you're including all the material requested. Give yourself some buffer. As I said before, that is a strict application deadline. So give yourself some buffer to coordinate with your RA partner and submit your application. And be sure to explain how you're solving the technical issues of your topic with your proposed solutions and approach. One of the feedback that we've gotten from topic authors in the past is sometimes people will put in a solution that doesn't seem to match the topic. So make sure you're looking at the solicitation and you're really doing a good job to explain how your approach is really solving and dealing with some of the issues outlined in that area. With that, that's the end of my presentation for now. I might bring up some additional slides on Ryan. Patty, I give the stage over to you. Thanks, Matt. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you all this afternoon. This is uh, an exciting program uh, for DOD and for the Army. And so I um, wanted to go over a few things related to contracting today. So the first thing that I will mention is that this opportunity is being solicited through a broad agency announcement or BAA as you'll hear us call it. And what makes a BAA different than how we solicit for many things in the Army is that in a BAA, BAA we are uh, providing you with topics of areas of research interest for us. And what we are looking for you to submit is your idea, your approach. So we're not looking for a cell job that says, hey, I can do anything in this technology area. We're looking for your particular research project idea as part of your proposal. It's very different than when the Army solicits, solicits for something very specific that it needs as far as like goods and services it's looking to require. And when we solicit for your ideas, you want to keep in mind that the, those that we select are typically the most meritorious, the most innovative um, exciting new ideas that we would like to uh, uh, have you pursue, fund you to pursue. Uh, that being said, this BAA, as, as thank you, as, as Matt already kind of alluded to, has a lot of things in there that you have to make sure that if you want to respond, you're responding appropriately so that your great idea, your proposal can be considered. As Matt mentioned, you know, the BAA closes at noon on the 12th of June. And so 1201, it's done. You can't submit. Um, and so, and it's, it, as he said, it's a very serious deadline. I can't, um, you know, uh, encourage you strongly enough to go early and to submit as early as you can so that if there are any hiccups that you can get things resolved and get your submission in on time. But the Submission time is just one of those kind of parameters you need to be really aware of and careful about. 
you have other things in this program, like for our um, your proposal, you need to have at least 40% of the effort done by a small business, your small business, and at least 30% of the effort has to be done by a single research institution. If you don't meet that in what you propose, your great idea will not be considered any further. There are also a number of forms that are required. Um, a new one, re relatively recent one regarding foreign influence that has to be filled out or completed. And if your proposal, again, with your great idea comes in without that form completed, then uh, the BAA says that we will not even evaluate your proposal. So your good idea will go nowhere um, if you do not have the mandatory forms included with your proposal. Another area I'll highlight is page limits. Uh, I believe for the Army, the page limit for the technical portion of the proposal is 10 pages. If your PDF comes out to be 11, according to the BAA, it will not, your proposal will not be evaluated. It will be found not to be in compliance with the BAA. And so there are a number of things through that BAA like this that you need to be concerned about so that um, you're able to submit a proposal that will be evaluated and won't have to be thrown out because you didn't pay attention to the basics of the, of the parameters that we set in our BAA. So you submit a proposal by the 12th. All right. And so then what happens next? Well, within 90 days of the closing date of the BAA, which is the 12th, you will have um, uh, some kind of answer as to whether you've been funded or not, right? Or whether you're going to be funded or not, whether you're selected or not. And so with that answer, right, that does not mean you start. It just means that you may have been selected for award. All right. And that notification will come from a program office, not the contracting office, right? Following that notification at some point, our contracting office will contact you concerning actually making the award for your phase one proposal. So that could be a number of different contracting offices across the Army. Um, the one that I work with most closely is the Research Triangle Park Division of Army Contracting Command Aberdeen Proving Grounds. So they're located, co-located with the uh, program managers of Army STTR in um, Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. And they do a lot of STT awards, but they do not do all of the awards. So let me tell you in general how they handle things. And most of this should be pretty similar when you're dealing with any of the other contracting offices. So once you're selected for award, the contracting office will receive your proposal and some other documentation uh, of how your proposal was evaluated and those kinds of things, and it will be sent to the contracting office for execution. So you will likely hear from somebody from the contracting office. For what purpose? Likely it would be maybe to fill out a couple more forms. They may want a few details uh, that aren't in your proposal. Uh, they may ask for more information about your cost. Um, I would encourage you, uh, if and when you hear from anybody from an Army contracting office that's talking to you about your proposal that the Army would like to award, um, please respond uh, as quick as you can to that. Uh, feel free to ask questions. If you don't understand what they're asking or why they're asking it, um, we're happy to answer those kinds of things. But please respond in a timely manner because the faster you respond, the faster they can do what they need to do to get that contract in place and get you actually working on your STTR Phase 1 award. So how is that going to work in general? Well, most of the time what will happen is that uh, you will basically take your total proposed, which cannot exceed 204000 for uh, a phase one, right? And it cannot exceed six months of a period performance. That's what the, the Army's parameters are. And you will take that amount, whatever you propose, and divide it by six. And what happens most likely is that you will receive um, one-sixth of the money each month as you progress working your phase one award. Reminder, phase one is about um, 
assessing the feasibility and merit of what uh, your idea is. And it kind of lands at the end with, all right, so then where, where do we go next and how do we know this is going to be something that will, um, if we invest in it further, be something that we can use in the commercial marketplace or the military can actually use for um, something. So in that six month period, right, one sixth of the amount is basically what you'll get each month. If there's something else that you're buying that um, uh, would uh, necessitate us adjusting a, an earlier, one of the earlier payments that make it at higher, whatever, you can have that con that conversation with contracting. But basically, what will happen is you will document what you accomplished in that month time frame, and you'll submit that report to the government, and they will. Uh, look to make sure that you are pursuing with due diligence what your your proposed idea is. You're making uh, appropriate progress, and then we'll pay you that that amount. That's the way most of the contracting offices will execute your STTR phase one, uh, and they're basically going to ask you to do what you said you were going to do in your proposal. Right? That's what your contract will be for. Now your contract will contain a lot of other terms and conditions that um, you can take a look at, um, you can ask questions about, but there are some standard things to govern how we do business with contractors, like what happens if, um, if we need to make some changes or what happens if somebody's not performing. So those clauses cover those kinds of things. And one of the other ones that I will highlight that is, um, I think, become pretty important for us to make sure we all understand is the technical data and the rights in the te technical data. And so this is where I want to highlight to you one other thing that the contracting office is going to need before you award. What is really important, particularly for STTR, is that we need an agreement between the parties of your, con of your proposal, your research institution, the small business, and how intellectual, pro intellectual property rights are going to be divvied up, how they're going to be handled as you as we pursue your idea, as we pursue this new technology that we want to have developed. And so um, you will see that that is, a, that is a requirement, not necessarily is something you have to have in your proposal, but it absolutely is something you have to have before award. And so while you don't have to write it and prepare it with your proposal necessarily, and if you haven't done that yet, but you should be having those kinds of conversations and think about how you would do that. Within DSIP, as uh, Matt referred to, there's a lot of resources out there with templates and things to help you learn things. And there's a template out there for this intellectual property agreement that you can take a look at uh, between the po partners so that you can get an idea of what you might do or what how you might structure such an agreement, but that will be definitely required before we make award. Now, when is award? Well, when you receive something, you know, uh, a contract that has been signed by a government contracting officer, then you can officially begin. That's when, it, when your award starts. So hopefully that'll give you a, a few ideas about what's going to happen and some things to keep in mind as you go through the process and I wish you all the best of luck with that. And um, I'm happy to entertain any other specific questions you might have. All right. Thank you very much. So we're going to bring Patty, Steph, and Tyler up on stage now, and we're going to start going through your questions. One major recommendation we have is please upvote your questions or upvote other questions that you might want to hear an answer to. That's going to increase the odds of us of getting to the questions. We probably have too many questions to get to. So the more questions that we can answer that serve multiple people, the more we can do. All right. That being said, we're going to go ahead and get started. We've seen this question a few times, but I'm going to go ahead and put this up on the screen. And this is a paraphrased version of the question. It's a little bit more elaborate version of it. But can a full-time employee of a research institution be a principal investigator on an STTR proposal involving a small business and a research institution?
I'll jump on that one. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, the PI, the principal investor, investigator uh, can indeed be the um, employee, a full-time employee of an RI. Um, that is one of the defining differences between us and the SBIR program. Okay. I'll, I'll also caveat with they cannot be listed on as both an employee of the RI and the small business on the proposal. They need to pick one. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Steph. Regarding the question, what percentage of the principal investigators total time will be on the project? Is there any minimum requirement for the six month period of performance? Thank you for this question, Kevin. Um, there's not a specific uh, requirement for percentage of time for the investigator itself, as much as um, just the 40% minimum for the small business and 30% for a single research institution. Um, you know, principal investigators are utilized by different um, organizations and universities differently to either be, you know, 10th time program managers all the way up to, you know, full time uh, research scientists. So uh, it really all depends on how your proposal is laid out. Um, just make sure that the budget and proposed work is meets the eligibility requirements and make sure that the title of principal investigator uh, makes sense for whatever you actually are proposing. Over. All right, thank you very much. Up oh, and for some reason, my camera does not seem to be working. So I might briefly refresh after this next question goes on stage. Um, our next question will be from Ram Lagudi. We don't have consultants, so how should I fill out the cost volume under the consultant section? That would be not applicable then if you don't have a consultant. You don't have to have all those items. They're just guidance in there if you have those. All right. I've now got my up the nose view, so I'm gonna keep working on my web camera in the background. In the meanwhile, um, another question we have is from Robert Dunn at EMS Lifeline. If a proposal is disqualified because the phase one to phase two transition rate benchmark, which is relatively new, and or the commercial rate, commercialization rate benchmark are not meant, will that information be detailed in the feedback? So yes. So what's interesting about this one is if you if you are disqualified because of the one of the commercialization or transition rate benchmarks that are um, put out by the SBA and those those lists actually just came out, um, then you would not even be eligible to be evaluated. So uh, if you were to request technical feedback, the feedback you you would get would be you were not evaluated due to non-compliance with, you know, this specific benchmark or this specific, you know, submission process. All right. All the success stories list universities, research institutions at armystr.com. Is the STTR program open to small businesses only? Up, oh, Tyler, we can't hear you all of a sudden. I was muted. Sorry. Uh, there's a 30% requirement for all uh, STTRs for a research institution as defined by law in. Uh, Title 15, Section 638, um, that basically says any university or college, um, federally funded research development center or other nonprofit research institution are all eligible um, to be to fill that 30%. Um, but uh, if you're looking to for an opportunity for a single small business only, I would have to point you to the SBIR program. 
Right, STTR requires, and this is in our STTR 101 PDF that you can find in the resources tab, STTRs require a research institution partner. Okay. Another question that we have from the audience is for, I think I'll paraphrase this one, but for anything that's a PDF document, can I digitally sign PDF documents or do I need to manually sign then scan and upload? I'm actually not tracking a requirement uh, to manually sign. However, we would have to be able to validate the um, electronic signature. So unless you're able to use like a DocuSign or a certificate, um, we would not be able to accept, you know, a, a, a paint, you know, signature to paste it into the signature block over. Patty, do you have anything to add to this? I was looking to see if we gave anything specific in this area, and I honestly don't see that we have direction. So I, but I think what Tyler said is true. We need to be able to validate if it's done digitally. And I just want to point out for a few people who have submit questions, please check in the comments of your questions. There are a few questions that were didn't actually have a question in them. They were more an explanation, but no underlying question. So please make sure that you are writing an actual question that we can potentially answer and not have to spend time interpreting. <laughs> I'll also say this, that uh, I think your best bet is to actually print and manually sign, uh, specifically because um, those documents, specifically the foreign disclosure one, are used in uh, validation of your self-disclosure of foreign ownership control or influence as well as well as uh you know the the joint venture form and and the other one so um if there was a if there was an issue with how the signature looked you may actually begin yourself into a, a fraud waste or abuse category where um army uh, criminal investigative uh, division would would actually step in. So um, I would just say, please uh, use whatever thing that you can provide that is legally defensible and legally accepted to uh, sign an authorized contract over. Yeah, I wouldn't risk it if you're not sure that we're going to be happy with it. I don't think that's like an insurmountable thing to do to print it out and sign it. From Hupeng Hong over at Advanced Analyzer Labs in Maryland, the support letters need to be submitted within volume five. Is that correct? Actually, for the Army STTR in our instructions, uh, which you'll see begin on page 63, you'll note that we request those to be included in the volume two. Thank you, Steph. And I think that's an example of the specifics of the Army STTRBAA or Trump any other general BAA advice. Is that correct? Yes, no matter what you hear today, whatever is in the BEA, BAA is what needs to be followed. All right, moving on to some of our upvoted questions. Um, I'm trying to see how to, so this may be a BAA technical problem question, um, but from Vitali, I'm trying to submit a proposal, but keep showing research institution 94% that does not allow me to submit volume three. I do not see what's wrong. 
Yeah, so. that's a question for the uh, DOD submission portal um, technical folks. Uh, we we can't go in and even look at your uh, submission until it's actually been submitted. Uh, so we personally cannot troubleshoot uh, those issues that you have for you. And I'll but, put I'll put the 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 DoD Cyber Stitter uh, submission portal um, support team uh, URL. Uh, I should say their email address into the comments. All right, and that's DoD SBR support at REI Systems dot com. So I'll throw that up on the screen also in between questions. Um, Kathleen Abbey, before ending today, can you please indicate how and where to access the previous webinars in the series? Yes, we can. So, Sean, you might have seen Sean dashing around in the chat and helping people out and resubmitting questions, but Sean will post a link. And Sean, why don't you go ahead and pin that link and add it to the <coughs> alerts tab, but we'll post a link directly to armystr.com. But if you go to armystr.com and the events tab, you can find all of our previous webinars. They're listed out for all of 2024. If you click on those links, it'll take you to the YouTube video and you can also just go straight to our YouTube page and you'll see all of our previous events. <coughs> Uh, I'm going to put up this question from Greg Hayward because I'm going to presume it's a question that we've heard before. And Greg's asking, are HSR projects accepted? But I think the real question here is, are open topics accepted? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I'm reading HSR as human subject research projects. Maybe. Oh. Maybe I misinterpreted. Okay, I know a different HSR acronym. My apologies. Go ahead, Tyler. So, <laughs> human subject research projects are accepted. However, I will say um, for a phase one, six months is not a lot of time to, to get the IRB and everything in place and have everything approved. Uh, to perform such um, research on human subjects. If you are proposing a proof of concept uh, in phase one, that in your phase two, you're thinking about doing human subject research. Uh, phase two, obviously, is two years and, and 1.36 million. So, um, you know, that that is much more doable. But uh, I would just caution anyone who's proposing that they could get human subject IRB completed in six months with the government. All right, thank you for that question. <clears throat> From John Farah at OptiComp Networks, Massachusetts, can the profit exceed 7% slightly? Like 7.5% is okay? That one I'm looking into. All right. We'll bring this back up and give Patty some time to do some research and answer that. But thank you for the question, John. If we don't get to it by the end of the meeting, I suggest doing a follow-up using the email address right here at the top of the screen. <laughs> US Army RTP DEFCOM dash RL MBX STTR dash PMO at Army.mil. We'll put this in the chat also to make it a little easier to copy and paste. Yeah, I just did a quick uh, search for profit in the 24.bbaa, and I'm not, I didn't find it at all. So I guess I, I'm not quite sure where they got the 7% from. That's my question as well, Tyler, because I don't remember seeing anything that specifies percentage in the um, BAA. So great. it would be great if the, if John could share with us the basis of, the seven percent where he got that i actually found the information on cyber.gov in one of their tutorials um and it says that 
uh, we are allowed by law uh, to give you a reasonable profit fee. And uh, the range is typically between 7 to 11%. And that's on sbir.gov. And so when we do look at profit or fee, I can give you this feedback. Um, we look at the risks associated with the project, right? So if we're doing something on uh, what we call a fixed price basis, in other words, you don't get paid unless you meet a certain requirement, that you have more risk. And so typically we do can accept a higher profit rate. Um, and that this would be more of a discussion, I I expect for phase two proposals than phase one proposals. But um, phase two, if we do entertain doing uh, more of a cost type arrangement, meaning more of a best effort arrangement with the cost, then typically the risk is less on your part. And so our profit rate goes lower um, that we would find, uh, you know, give you as, as what we consider reasonable. The other thing to keep in mind that affects this discussion is what are we getting at the end? Uh, in the end of phase one, it's, it's typically, you know, reports, papers, things like that. But if you do have something that you're going to pursue on a phase two, and there's going to actually be some kind of other than piece of paper delivered as a, as a functional model or a prototype, or you've gotten that far, um, and there's something uh, more tangible that would be delivered, um, that would take us typically into some of the higher ranges of profits. So that's just some general guidelines um, uh, that we use. Actually, DOD in their regulations has a formula, like spreadsheet that we fill out every time that we look at fee or profit rates to, to determine, you know, what is fair. We want to be fair and give, um, and, but those are some of the variables that will make the, what the government will see as an acceptable, reasonable profit level. Um, uh, you know, those are some of the variables that we will use and, and how they might impact over. Thank you for that comprehensive answer, Patty. That was very helpful. And John, I hope that answers most components of your question. Okay, we've got another question from Ram that I think a few people upvoted, and that is technical volume two, section 13. So we're getting in the weeds on this one. Identification and assertion of restrictions on the government's use, release, or disclosure of technical data or computer software. We don't have anything to fill that table. Can we say none and delete the table? Say none. But keep the table? I, I think it makes it clear that you have none because if you delete the table, then we have the question, did you address this or not? All right. Here is an interagency question. So the BAA says, and I'm presuming this is the Army STTR BAA, feasibility docs and DP2 pro proposals cannot be based upon nor any prior work from SBIR work. The AF SBIR office interprets this as saying solely based on SBIR work. Can the Army proposal include info on prior adaptations made with SBIR? So we, we're not talking SBIR here. So there is no direct phase two for STTR. So I guess I'm a little confused. Um, I mean, as far as tech transition and commercialization, if you have identified other DOD partners um, that you previously worked with that this may transition to as for as transition potential, that's something you can discuss, um, but I'm not, there's no direct to phase two, so I'm not quite sure what that has to do with this question. Over. I'm wondering if it has to do with the, if the STTR proposal can be based on the SBIR work. 
but Scott, feel free to add a comment to your original question and we'll try to follow this up with additional clarification. Yeah, I mean, if, if that was the case, then the whatever SCTR topic you'd be applying to, the work proposed would have to fit that topic and would not be work that would either be continued or replicated uh, by a previously funded SBIR or SDTR topic. It can be adjacent, but it cannot be duplicative or an extension of. All right, thank you, Tyler. So Kamalika Gatak at Alpha Micron Ohio is asking, can a business incubator be a research partner? Um, I wanna say no, but I, you would have to see how they are incorporated or, or I guess what category they fall under. I mean, if they're a, research institution as defined by the law, like a 501c3 or something like that, then possibly. But uh, if they don't actually perform research and they're just an incubator, I don't see how that is possible. So they need to be a nonprofit organization. They need to be a research institution. So they need to be someone conducting active research. And then from there, they also outline the three categories, which is a nonprofit research institution, a nonprofit university, or an FFRDC. So if you think this business incubator probably doesn't fit the university or FFRDC, but if it, you think it fits that first category of nonprofit research institution, you need to make sure that they have compelling document that reflects as such. Is that correct, Tyler? Yeah, so it had to be very clear as how they fit the eligibility requirements of the research institution as defined by law, which once again is Title 15, United States Code Section uh, 638. All right, we have quite a few questions left. So I'm just trying to find the ones that are going to hit up the most partners. Oh, so Scott did clarify it re refers to direct to phase two topic and feasibility study requirements. So. I believe, Scott, you're going to need to talk with Army SBIR because there are no direct to phase two for Army STTR. <laughs> so just to follow up on Scott's question and uh, Tyler's earlier response. But this is strictly STTR and they are considered separate programs with different focuses. <laughs> But anything, so Tyler, just to clarify, Scott said the question relates to Army D2, P2 topic and the feasibility study requirements. So I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to your question or the uh, add to your answer in that regard. Uh, no, because STTR does not have any direct phase two. Um, so it would have to strictly be a SBAR uh, question for a different program, the, the other SBAR program. Which I think transcends as well, just to get John's question answered. Is there a similar SBIR contracting office for small businesses, presumably Army SBIR? So this conference, this particular webinar and this particular team is solely focused on Army STTR. But Tyler, do you have anywhere you'd like to point people who are interested in Army SBIR? And Steph, can you post the link to the Army SBR.mil address, please, uh, in the chat? 
Um, that will be your best bet to get information on the SBIR program. It does have information on the SCTR program as well, but uh, that is the main um, main source. Uh, and it also has a contact us uh, for you to get in contact with them to discuss a direct phase two issue or concern question. All right. This is a question pre-submitted ahead of time. So is there a follow-on phase two STTR award if we are awarded a phase one? If yes, what's the procedure for applying for a phase two? So the there are phase two awards under STTR. Um, the process is after the, the process is annual. So annually, uh, we go out to eligible phase one participants or or, or recently finished phase one uh, awardees uh, to encourage them to apply for phase two. Um, when doing so, we also encourage you to talk to your TPOC to ensure that they are supportive of the phase two. Um, so upon successful fa phase one completion, uh, you would you know, get an email um, from us annually, typically around uh, this time frame, actually, uh, to uh, start the process for a phase two proposal. Uh, those proposals are also uh, uploaded through DSIP. And, um, you know, there is an evaluation and, and uh, selection process at that time as well. Uh, the phase two, um, Phase two procedures and kind of uh, just general information are also listed in the BAA uh, under the, our Army STTR component instructions. Um, but uh, so I encourage you to read that. And then if you have any other questions, uh, go to armystr.com uh, for some answers on that as well. So this is a elaboration, I think. We just pulled this from the Survey Monkey. Um, we are a small business and partner with a nonprofit foundation who provides us with lab capabilities, test personnel, and software system integration expertise. The core, and let me make sure I got this right, the core research is performed by the small business. Would the nonprofit qualify as a research partner in this case? And what could I do in order to find out about that? Um, it, it also depends on the, the relationship when you say partner with. Is the small business and the nonprofit foundation, is the nonprofit just uh, another arm of the small business because then there would be a parent company involved and now would probably say no um once again i'm just going to point you to the statute and uh look at how it defines research institution and if you believe that nonprofit foundation that would be have to be separate from your small business uh is eligible under those then um you know, I encourage you to apply. Uh, if there is an issue during any proposal where the research institution is not found eligible, then, uh, you know, obviously the proposal will be non-compliant, but also that would be, um, that would be a part of your technical feedback as well, that you propose a, a non-eligible research partner. And Tyler, can you share that exact uh, number and clause you said in the chat, just for people who, we're having difficulty writing it down. Those yeah, so who are title, watching the recording should be able to easily catch it. Uh, title 15, United States Code 638 is the uh, SBR STTR authorization. And uh, if you just do a quick uh, find control F on the web page for research institution, uh, it should be one of your first results as a link to the actual de the statutory definition of that. So tile code 15 and 638. The definition of BAA itself and 
keep in mind that that research institution, if if that organization meets that definition, will have to do at least 30% of the work. All right. All right, here's a one I've not seen before. Are patent application costs, either fees or attorney charges allowed to be included in the budget? Must they be US or can they also include foreign patent applications? Well, I'll tell you, I'm gonna start from the end of the question. Um, Foreign applications would be of a concern just strictly due to the due diligence and research protection and security um, from a research security perspective. Uh, so I guess there would be a, a very large question of why you would be filing a patent uh, in a foreign country, especially a foreign country of concern. Um, I guess my other question is, I don't know how you would be able to project patent application costs uh, because you don't, I can't say for certain how you'd be able to tell for sure that you'd be able to pro produce something patentable within those six months. Um, and, and we would not be reimbursing you for any uh previous patent application costs that would you know that you're bringing ip to the table with so um i'm probably going to say no but i'm sure there's probably a way this would be covered patty have you seen this before not that i recall um but 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 again your your point is well taken tyler because how do you know you're going to have that unless you discover something or reduce it to practice underneath our effort we wouldn't be paying, as Tyler said, for something that you've already discovered um, on your own nickel or in another way. Um, and so how, how would you know? Um, I think very unlikely under phase one, if there was any time that it, that it potentially could happen is in phase two. But again, it's, it's a, you know, you're proposing something um, with the anticipation that it's going to happen because if it's already happened, we're not going to be paying for it. It would be something that we would pay for is uh, uh, that potentially I think we might be able to pay for if something was discovered or first reduced to practice under our funding in what we're doing. So um, that's basically, and in the foreign, like you said, the foreign applications would be of concern uh, because performance under this has to be in the United States. And so then why would we even, you know, want to uh, pursue that? Why would it make sense for the army or the federal government to pay those costs? Uh, not impossible to start, you know, dealing with, but that's a lot of questions that we would want answered before we would be comfortable paying for those costs. Thank you all for your answer there. If the small business doesn't have a, thank you for spelling out this acronym, negotiated indirect rate agreement, will the Army slash DOD negotiate an indirect rate during the negotiation stage? This feels Not like likely. Um, we would probably find a, a, this is where different contracting offices might approach things different. When it comes to uh, indirect rates and what we care about, um, certainly if you've already negotiated a rate with the, within DOD or even within the federal government, um, that would help us to be able to use that um, uh, information. Uh, but if you have not, um, I think my first stance would not be to run out and negotiate that rate or get because that would involve uh, calling in defense contract audit agency auditors 
and having them come in and look at your books. And I'm not sure we want to take the time to do all those things. Now, what we would need to do is feel comfortable that your organization is operating under generally acceptable or accepted accounting procedures. And so we might ask you questions about, particularly in phase two, about your you know, how your accounting is set up, how you're doing uh, with your accounting to be able to feel comfortable that you're operating in a way that that basically will be able to separate out the cost for this agreement versus your other work in your institution and also, you know, basically charge for things that the government is allowed to pay for. Um, but I don't think it is likely for us to negotiate a an agreement with you um, underneath our phase one or phase two awards. Um, but some contracting offices may look into having an audit done and being able to basically audit your rate, right? Um, that's not necessarily the same thing as a rate agreement, but at least audit your rate for acceptability prior to making a phase two award. All right, thank you, Patty. We've got time for a couple more questions. Um, quick question from Greg. Does each project have a dedicated TPOC at the university partner? And I think this is just a clarification question from Tyler or Stephanie on what the TPOCs are. So yeah, so the TPOC is the DO or the Army um, scientist or engineer uh, that has written the topic and is a subject matter expert in, in the given topic for the Army. Um, they, there is no dedicated TPOC at the university partner. Um, I mean, the university partner would obviously have a, the key personnel listed on the proposal that you would work with. Um, but from the government point of view, uh, the only really true Army representative that you'll be talking to as your main point of contact will be the, the topic author or the TPOC that was listed on the BA before uh, closed for citizen. Thank you. And I apologize. And we're not going to get to everyone's questions today. So I'm trying to find the ones that might address the most number of people. Um, James, you have a fairly interesting question. So. An early prototype for technology was funded in part from an SBIR from another agency. DOD SBIR BAA states direct to phase two feasibility cannot expend from prior SBIR work. Um, we already addressed prior and phase two, the STTR program does not do direct to phase two. If you have SBIR phase two questions, you can talk to the SBIR question. But I guess my question for you, Tyler, based on this question is, if someone has technology based on earlier SBIR grants, well, SBIR contracts, not grants, SBIR contracts, can they submit to an STTR using that technology approach? Uh, so, the reason you're typically not allowed to submit for direct to phase two is because if you were previously funded under an SBR grant, um, you would have to be awarded either a sequential or an enhanced phase two or something like that because the research and the prototype funded from an army SBR. Um, and so the direct to phase two is strictly for those who have not received that funding but are so far along in their technology that they can skip the phase one process, which for SBIR um, is a very high bar. Um, so in the case of this, if you wanted to look at a STTR, um, unfortunately you would, you would not be able to submit for a phase one using the SBIR technology because uh, it's already been funded through SBIR. So you would have to, if you were interested in um, STTR, which means you would be partnering with a research institution, you would actually be looking at a sequential phase two through our program. 
Um, and those are, are very competitive. Um, we do, we have had cross agency, um, awards before. And so I would, if you're interested in a sequential phase two with SDTR, I would first recommend you, your first point of contact should be the original SBIR uh, awarding office to discuss how your best path would be to, to get there. Thank you. We have one more pre-submit question that the team spent a little background time working on prior to the meeting. So I did want to put it up. And uh, Steph, uh, this is grounded in our earlier conversation, but if someone's firm or their small business has a name change and needs to get a new ID, what steps should they take to make sure they're able to submit on time? All right, so uh, one thing that we needed to look up was what exactly was the SBC control ID? Because this is not something that uh, the Army looks at when we're um, making awards. Uh, this is actually something that you need in order to submit a proposal through DSIP. So you don't need it in order to register. However, you do need that uh, SBC control ID in order to actually complete your certification and submit your proposal. Um, so really the question is, um, would the firm be able to submit under their old name if there is a delay in them getting their S new SBC control ID with their new firm name? And I guess that's, I would say that's more of a question for Patty. Um, would they be able to use their old name and their old SBC control ID and UEI while they're waiting for this, this new control ID and other underlying information? So that's a really good question. Since, since really uh, from a contracting perspective, the SBC control ID and certification is not something that we look for. Um, I would just tell you to make sure that in the proposal, when you submit, um, that there is a organization listed with a UEI and registered in SAM that we can easily track. Hopefully, uh, if you are making a change and you're just getting this the SBC control ID updated, which is a separate thing, right? Um, hopefully you can do that quickly, but for purposes of, you know, when we receive in contracting your proposal to fund, we need to be able to, whatever that name of the organization is on the proposal, we need to find it in SAM.gov. It's got to have a current registration, it's got to have a UEI, and if we don't have those things, we cannot uh, make award. Right. Unfortunately, I think that's about all the time we have today. If we didn't get answer your question, I've pinned direct outreach options to Army STTR at the top of the screen. You'll also see in the chat there should be links to um, the US code that governs the STTR process. That should help those of you still with questions on research institutions. If, you're ha if you've submitted your BAA, you're having contradictory information coming out of the portal. This one's specifically addressed at Vitali. Sorry, we couldn't address your second question. Again, you will go and want to reach out to that DOD SBIR support link at reisystems.com. Um, but hopefully this information will be useful to everyone whose questions we weren't able to get to. I will also note that the, just to reiterate, SGTR does not do open topics. What you see in the BAA is what's available and you can no longer reach out to the topic authors. So if you have questions in a specific topic area, I suggest you check out the answers that were posted in CITIS or check out some of our Q&A and event videos that could provide you some answers to some of your technical questions. Hey Matt, um, real before, quick, before you sign off, um, I just want to say that uh, going back to the patent question, I was just uh, made aware that uh, we have seen 
uh, patent application assistance uh, in um, tablet requests before. So while it wouldn't be in the actual, you know, budget line of the STTR, uh, we have seen it in um, tablet requests, which is the $6,500 for the six months max uh, for phase one that you'll see under uh, technical and business assistance section um, of the BAA. Over. Thank you so much, Tyler. And I was actually going to say, Patty, Steph, Tyler, are there any additional items that you would like to note or add before we close out? I'm good. Same here. I'll just say, please read the BAA. We've, we've, we've said it enough, or we've said it a lot, but we'll keep on saying it. So just please read and submit, ensure all of your documents and things are filled out correctly and uploaded correctly. Uh, even if DSIP says you are 100% and you submit, and it turns out you're not 100%, unfortunately, you will still be deemed non-compliant. So just ensure that you are submitting what you know to be 100%. And I want to thank everyone for attending. I hope we were able to point you in the right direction for your questions and answer the majority of your questions. Uh, we do have a small survey. Sean just put it in the chat. Thank you, Sean. We ask if you can just take two or three minutes. That just lets us know how we can make these events better in the future. It's thanks to y'all's feedback that we started providing a uh, pre-event questionnaires so that we can let you submit some of your questions ahead of time and make sure we're better prepared for them. So please, please take a minute, either whip out your phone, take a photo of that link on the left or answer below. We are going to be taking a short break on events for a while while the solicitation period is ongoing. So you won't see another event coming out from Army STTR for a few weeks, but then we're hoping to come back with some off-season events. These are just going to be teaching more about the Army research ecosystem, provide you networking opportunities, provide you chances to reach back further and be prepared, prepared for the 2025 solicitation, which will be a new set of topics, new set of opportunities. But we want to thank for everyone who's joined us for the webinars over these past couple of weeks and wish you luck with your submission process. All right, with that, I am going to go ahead and close out the webinar just because I got a little chat for a quick request. If you still have additional questions, please feel free to use the links on the screen. They're also in the chat. If you're having issues with the submission portal, if your numbers aren't lining up or something seems to be technically wrong, technical issues should go to DOD, SBIR, support, and if you are having issues with, uh, if you have any additional questions on the BAA, we've got one more email address up on screen. Uh, Tyler, Steph, is there a final day you will be replying to emails? In regards to questions? In regards to questions in the US Army RTP, DEVCOM, ARL, MBX, STTR, PMO email address. Oh, um, no. yeah, we look at that every day. <laughs> so okay. there, there's no time limit. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us. As I said before, we will be leaving a networking space open for anyone who wants to chat with their peers, but it will be unmoderated. Thank you.